So it's my great pleasure today uh, to introduce our next speaker, Richard Butler. Uh, I first met Richard when uh, Robert and I attended a lecture he gave on the courthouses of West Cork. Um, and although he touched upon them as architecture, his talk was really about the historical context that created the climate in which these buildings were seen as a necessity. Uh, now, the next time I ran into him was when we were both writing about the Catholic Church in Drimalee, which he will be talking about today. And he was incredibly generous in sharing information with me. Um, because, you see, even though Richard is ostensibly writing about architecture and the built environment, what he's really talking about is social history. It's that vortex of forces, political, economic, judicial, religious, cultural, personal, that most of us don't really think about it, about because it's so familiar to us. Um, so we need voices like Richard's so that we can say, oh yeah, gosh, never thought about that, never thought, thought that way. Richard is a native of Bantry, and he's currently a lecturer in the Historic Built Environment at the University of Leicester, the Centre for Urban History. He completed his uh, BA and MPhil and PhD at St. John's College, Cambridge, and he was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, besides all his other interests, such as sailing and railways, uh, he's working on a history of town planning in Ireland. His talk today will take us back to Cork in the 60s, when Bishop Julius Lucy strode the scene like a colossus and embarked on an ambitious program of church building. So please welcome Richard Butler. Okay, thanks everyone. As Roy Foster commented yesterday, the Irish War of Independence, the Irish Civil War, was quite a brief period of not very much violence, of not very much killing, followed by decades of rather dull peace. If you compare it to other revolutions across the world, particularly Eastern Europe, parts of South Central Africa, Southeast Asia, what happened in Ireland was really quite minor. And I think I'm amazed at how much impact and influence it has at conferences today. So I'm going to steer well away from talking about who killed who in around 1920. And actually, what I want to think about is what are the major changes that have happened in the last 100 years? Now, the obvious one people say is independence. We've had that for the last day here. But what are the actual major changes that have happened in the last 100 years here? Anyone want to guess some? Particularly of women, absolutely, yeah. Rural depopulation. Economic, get people, Ireland becoming rich. Yeah, that's, what else? Exactly, part of getting rich. Yeah. Um, anything else? Second education. Second education, yeah. That's <laughs> um, Okay, yeah, sure. Take that one too. Yes, yeah. That's, that's absolutely true. The influence of the church collapsing. Um, and if you think about those bigger changes, I was just jotting down, for me the, the three big ones are um, the changing role of women, the fact that Ireland became rich and what that has meant, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, and the collapse of religion. And I think those three together are far more important than who killed who in around 1920. And so I'm going to focus today actually on the Catholic Church and what happened to the church. And people have asked me, but well, why are you working on the 1950s, the worst decade of Irish history, as everyone says, the lost decade, decade of failure, immigration, so on and so on. The 50s is seen as the high point of Catholic power in Ireland. It's seen as that peak influence of the Roman Catholic Church. If you look at mass attendance, it's around 90, 92% in the 50s. It stays that way into the 70s, and today it's about 10 or 15%. No other country in the world has seen such a rapid collapse of, of weekly mass attendance within the, church, the Catholic Church as Ireland has. And those of you who know more about Catholic history or Irish history in general will know that in the early 19th century, the Irish Catholic Church was not very powerful. And in rural areas, it w had to work against the survival of what we would now maybe term pagan practices or local 
folklore, local religious practices. I've come across in local histories of the original church in Cora, not that far from here, being dismantled by local parishioners at night time because they didn't want to pay for it in the 1830s. And the priest having to basically employ pagan language to say there'll be a curse on all of you if you, if you don't stop dismantling the to get it built. So actually what we're looking at is a very brief period when the Catholic Church became very powerful, by, by which I mean the late 19th century, and into the 1940s and 50s, followed by a very rapid collapse. And the kinds of questions that poses for historians are, well, was the church ever really very powerful? If it was, how do you explain how it collapsed so quickly? Institutions that are powerful tend to stay powerful. If you look at, say, the mafia, they are ab astonishingly resilient in how powerful they are in parts of Sicily today as they were 150, 250 years ago. And yet the Roman Catholic Church has collapsed. So what happened? And those are the kinds of questions I think I want to pose today, ostensibly by talking about church building in the 50s. But actually it's a bigger thing about looking at what was Ireland like in the 50s. And I know that that will immediately bring up two obvious problems. Or not problems, but in things to think about. One is that we all have, I think, quite strong views about the 50s. Not really very positive ones in general. We have to temper that when we think about it today. The other is that many people here in the room will remember the 50s very vividly. And again, I think the, 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 the question, the problem for us is, for all of us, is try and step back from that and look at the 50s from some distance today, which we can do, right? It's 70 years ago or so, 60 years ago. And look at it and try and see, well, what was happening in the 50s? What was Ireland like then? And how is it different to today? And how do we explain the change from Ireland in the early 50s, my talk today, to Ireland today? That's the kind of the key question that I'm interested in. Um, so, okay, so that, that's my, my preface for the talk. Um, this is something I worked on a few years ago, and I'm coming back to it now. I'm very grateful to a few people for their help with this. Cecilia Wilcox in Dromore especially, the archivist Ita Gimblet uh, in, in Cork City, in the Cork Diocesan Archives. Um, Danny Pyburn, the parish priest, Dromore and Cora, I think he's still the parish priest there. Um, Fanula Finley, and um, also the Murphy Brothers architects in Cork City, who I was able to interview when I was working on this a few years ago. So um, this is an, a picture of the Church of Dromore, which is the center of my um, case study today. But really, the center of the case study is the man on the left. Um, many of you will know who it is. Cornelius Lucy, born 1902, died 1982, Bishop of Cork and Ross. Um, when Lucy consecrated the new parish church at Cora in West Cork, many of you will have driven past Cora today, coming if you came from Bantry, that was um, consecrated in June 1963. The magazine that he had established as the diocese kind of mouthpiece a decade earlier, which they ran with the headline, The Great Ten Years in Cora. And by this they meant that in that ten years, Lucy had overseen the construction of ten new churches, five of which were the Rosary Churches in Cork City, um, which he had termed that they would girdle the city suburbs of Cork. It was a very ambitious project of church building. And Lucy, who was interesting in many ways, he was a very um, astute intellectual. He gave many interesting sermons that we can look at today to understand what his view of the world. What he uh, undertook from the early 50s as Bishop of Cork and Ross was the, the most extensive church building program in Ireland since Parnell, um, by which I mean kind of since the late 19th century, and or since O'Connell. So we're actually looking at one of the great periods, most kind of intense periods of church building in West Cork and in, uh, in South Munster in general, and actually across all of Ireland to be fair. Um, and what's interesting is that this was in a decade of economic stagnation, of poverty and emigration, of there not being money for very much, but there was somehow plenty of money for church building. And how did that happen? Um, and I'll talk about Lucy's city churches briefly in this lecture, but I'm really interested in the rural churches, so Drumore in particular, and also Drumalegh, um briefly. And my case study really does focus in on um, Drumore Church here, which was built between 1953 and 1955 um, near, near Bantry. I think actually that I mentioned this a minute ago that the, 
our history of the 1950s is now primed for some kind of significant revision, I think. Not revisionist history, but simply people to work on it and do something on it, as opposed to simply ignore it, which was the case for so long. Um, the standard text on this is, in some ways, still John Henry White's book, um, Church and State in Modern Ireland. The second edition came out in 1980, so really that's quite a long time ago now. Um, and there's been a lot written more recently about the concept of a lost decade. This is the book edited by um, Dermot Kyo, um, Ireland, The Lost Decade of the 1950s. Um, but we really kind of need to push a bit further than that and look at the 50s and see, well, what was life like then for normal people, day-to-day -day life um, in the countryside, in the towns, in the cities, um, and, to see, and to see also who were the people who had power and how did they use it at this time. Um, for those interested, I suppose, in visual history, art and architecture, there's been some work in, re in recent years on 50s aesthetics or post-war aesthetics in general, but there's still not very much. And I'm, I'm still kind of taken back to a quote um, from Brian Fallon's book, An Age of Innocence, where he said, quote, the clergy were mostly Philistines, as was immediately obvious from the ugliness of many or most of the parish churches. Um, which is an opinion, and people will agree or disagree with it, um, but it, in my mind, hints actually at the lack of work done on the subject, that you, all you can really say about it is that, well, the church was really ugly, and the priests didn't really know very much. And, then that's all, and that's the end of the debate. There was a lot more to it than that, and I'm trying to open that up um, today. And I think even today, people have a view that's quite negative of church building of this time period. Maybe not so much with Tremor Church, um, but certainly you find that opinion in Galway. If you talk about Galway Cathedral, opened 1965, um, the British critic Ian Nairn wrote about the cathedral for the Observer newspaper, and he said, quote, The Roman Catholic Church in every other country of Western Europe has accepted modern architecture. Only Ireland lags behind as the last outpost of reaction. Again, pretty hostile commentary from the time. Um, but I want to look at it more broadly and look at the, who, who built the churches, how were they funded, the designers, what were the ideas going on in the design, more than just simply looking or, or just simply critiquing it and saying that it was ugly um, or that the designers didn't know very much about what they were doing. And so the background for this really is to talk about the Catholic Church after the, the establishment of the Free State. Um, and the term that many historians use is Catholic triumphalism in the years after independence. Um, and many see that a high point of that kind of Catholic triumphalism in the 1932 Eucharistic Congress in Dublin. Um, John Henry White terms the, the years around 1950 the culmination, he says, of Irish history ever since independence, a time when the Catholic social movement, through what he says, was the conditioning of the language of public discourse. In other words, by conditioning the types of arguments and debates people were having in the country, sought to obtain a type of political and social power that it didn't have before. He terms this Catholic integralism. We don't have to get too worked up about the terms of it. But many of you will know that they were key um, papal encyclicals of these years that set out the powers of the church. Um, Rerum Novarum, 1891, and Quadrissimo Anno, in particular, 1931, that, that set out the conservative, powerful Catholic church. We can also look at groups like the Christus Rex Society, in terms of conservative Catholic teaching, formed 1945. Um, individual bishops, such as Lucy, went around at confirmations and gave sermons preaching on a wide variety of issues, normally giving quite a hard-line um, right-wing Catholic perspective on them. So if you read the Southern Star, you can see Lucy's sermons on the breakdown of rural society, agriculture, immigration, the dangers of communism, the dangers of Trinity College Dublin, um, <laughs> the lack of industry, the need for more marriages, the Irish language, pub opening hours, morals in family life, and so on and so on. And on it goes. Everywhere Lucy went, he gave a sermon at confirmation time about some issue like this. And, and they are fascinating to read because you get a view into his idea of the world or what the world maybe might have been or should have been. And I suppose we look at the time as well now and think, well, how was... The all of these sermons about morals or about Trinity College Dublin or socialism seem out of touch with what seem to be the major problems of the period, which, as I mentioned earlier, are immigration and economic 
um, recession throughout the 50s. And it is um, amazing how little attention was given to some of those issues in, in speeches. So, for example, the balance of payments crisis between 1951 and 1954, the budget deficits of the late 50s, were actually major problems for the Irish government try and trying to provide services. Or, of course, the ever-increasing um, drain of emigration. And this is from um, a book called The Vanishing Irish of the 50s um, that I think slightly overplayed the extent of the crisis, but suggested that um, if things kept going as they, as they were, then there would be no one left um, in the country. Um, and for many outside observers, they, wrote, they write about Ireland in the 50s as what they term a theocratic state, so a country where the, the, the church is immensely powerful, and the church actually controls um, how everything works. And, and I think that's, maybe there's some truth in that, but it's not entirely clear. And again, to come back to the big question, if the, church, uh, the church's influence has collapsed in Ireland, as it did collapse so quickly, how was it very powerful in the 50s? Or how, if it was powerful, how did it go away so quickly? Those are the big questions that we need to think about if we go down the theocratic state route. Um, John O'Brien, an American who, who wrote the book where this illustration came from, um, in the beginning of the book, he kind of introduced Ireland by saying, quote, Ireland is a Catholic nation. The Irish love the church and revere her priests. So very keen to set out how religious and how Catholic the country was. Another interesting source, and this is Chris Epper. Some of you may have even met Chris Epper. Um, he wrote a book about Bantry in the 70s and 80s, an anthropological study of the conflicting power of business, church, and state. People aren't named in it, but you can easily work out who G.W. Biggs are and, <laughs> and, and how the whole thing was set up. And it's quite a good read, actually. Um, and he travelled around Bantry in the 70s, and he thought that the, ch the people he met there had a pervasive Catholicity, he said, and that was expressed in the media, literature, song, and in the very idioms of their language. And I think that's probably a very, uh, very acute ant ob observation from an anthropologist. And we all know about that, the, the different figures of speech that we use that are actually inherently religious um, in terms of, you know, God be with you or whatever else. Uh, we, have the, we have lots of them. Um, and he said, quote, Bantry people keenly appreciate the fact that compared with the English, Catholics and Catholics from other countries, religion occupied a distinctive place in their life. Something maybe we, we wouldn't say today. So, um, today Dremor is a hamlet, uh, there's a church, a primary school, and there's a few houses. The church there is a chapel of ease, so it's, the, it's in the Cora diocese, the main church is in Cora. Um, the parish priest responsible for the new church at Tremor was Father Patrick, later Canon um, Patrick Henshi, who was parish priest in Cora between 1953 and 1955. And Henshi held many placements throughout his long career that conditioned his understanding of rural Ireland. He wrote a lot for the Fold magazine, Lucy's Diocesan magazine. He wrote in a kind of historical way. He wrote in a very kind of romantic historical way about the rural landscape. And in that, we really get a strong sense of his admiration for, the, for topography, for antiquarianism, for folklore, and so on. Um, Henshi also wrote a piece about his life for the Fold, which is very useful to be able to piece together who he was and put together his experiences. So we, we know from that article that he was born in St. Patrick's Parish in Cork City, in the poor north inner city, and he went to Maynooth, where he was ordained in 1913. He then spent 10 years teaching at the city seminary at St. Finbar's in Farn Ferris. And after a brief period in a south city parish, the Lock, um, in 1926, he made his first break out of the city for rural Cork, when he was appointed inspector of diocesan schools by the then Bishop Daniel Colan. Um, Henshi wrote himself that he spent almost five years, quote, travelling with the catechism. And the opportunity to travel, and, and then remember he would have been one of the few people who, who had a car in the late 30s, gave him, in his own words, quote, an insight into the topography of the Diocese of Cork. He then spent four years as curate in the Bandon Parish, and he remembered um, his boss there, Canon Martin Murphy, as, quote, a great man for high masses and processions. That's a certain type of priest that we can all can imagine. A great man for high masses. And as someone who was always doing things to the church and graveyards, always fixing things, always adding things. Murphy's predecessor in Bandon 
um, had, I think, though, done more to deserve this compliment. And during his time in Bandon, a new chapel of ease had been built at Gagan. You, if you drive down a guilty from Bandon, you'll go past it on the road. It's where the railway junction used to be as well. Um, the, both the, the laying of the foundation store, stone for Gagan and the consecration ceremony um, received extensive coverage in the local press of the time who recorded every word spoken by the priests and also listed all of the clergy who turned up by in order of their hierarchy. So in many cases in, in Southern Star, it's an entire column listing the 130 priests who turned up by you know, um, canon, parish priest, curate, and so on, and so on down. So again, yeah, an amazing list using up vast amounts of the, of the paper. Um, I don't know who actually would have read it, but anyway... <laughs> The press's willingness to devote so much space to religious matters, I think, is probably difficult for us to understand today. Um, but that was very normal at the time. And if we look at the accounts of the laying of the foundation stone and the consecration at Gagan near Bandon in the 30s, um, the language used was coloured by the Catholic triumphalism of those years. And um, so the consecration ceremony was in 1929. So that's in the lead-up to 1932 Eucharistic Congress. And so that's always there in the background. And also, the foundation stone was laid by chance on the same day as the preceding Eucharistic Congress opened in Sydney. Um, and in the speech, the priest drew attention to the many priests from Ireland who had, he, he said, founded the Catholic Church in Australia. And he said, quote, our race is worthily represented by the vast array of bishop, priests, and laity of Irish birth there. He pointed to a symbiotic relationship between crowds in Sydney and what he termed, quote, the humble little foundation-laying ceremony. He said, quote, separated as we are by land and ocean, yet we are all one in faith because we are all members of that worldwide spiritual and yet visible kingdom of the church. So very clear religious language being used to tie together the small community in Bandon with the hundreds of thousands of people in Sydney, Australia. Um, and when the church was formally opened, it happened to, it also coincided with a, a large mass in Westminster in London to mark the centenary of Catholic emancipation. So again, centenaries, anniversaries are very useful for these types of events. And so 100 years since Daniel O'Connell and Catholic emancipation was a good reason to have a big speech in Bandon about um, the church's triumph. And so the bishop, um, Daniel Colan, said, quote, outside the with the loss of the mass and the real presence, the remnants of the Christian religion are being surrendered or lost or dissipated year by year. He's talking really about the Soviet Union um, in this. And he said, while never was devotion to true religion more flourishing, and I think never more flourishing than that Sunday in Gagan, the church was praised for being quite cheap to be built. It cost about four and a half thousand punts, and also for the employment of many local men in building it. As the curate in Bandon during these the years that followed, Henshi, who went on to build the church in Dromore, um, would have been one of his jobs would have been to say mass regularly in this chapel of ease. Um, that's obviously the normal thing. The curate would do the, the smaller church, and the parish priest would do the bigger church. Um, so. He would have worked in, in this church for four or five years, saying masses there regularly when it was brand new. And I think that's there in the background for when he later in his life went on to build a new church at Tremore and to actually do some other building work as well. So he, he saw what you could do by building new churches and then brought that with him when he became parish priest and had some um, kind of clout himself. But in 1935, after almost years in West Cork, Canon Henshi was brought back into the inner city as the curate for the very deprived city parish of Saints Peter and Paul, just off um, Patrick Street. He remembered a quote as smoke and lanes and miles of stairs and countless cases, by which he meant cases, cases of acute poverty. He said it took a lot of getting used to, but he was there for 18 years in Cork City. And, and during the very end of his time in Cork City, there were huge changes in the diocese. Daniel Colan died in August 1952, after 36 years as bishop, and he paved the way for Cornelius Lucy, who had been acting bishop, coadjutor bishop, since January 1951. Lucy came with a formidable reputation. I think anyone here who knows about Lucy will, I think the word formidable 
is often attached to him. Um, he, had, he was ordained at Maynooth in 1927, and he spent much of the following two decades studying in Dublin and at Innsbruck, another great Catholic centre of teaching in Austria, and teaching philosophy, or, or moral philosophy, as Professor of Ethics at Maynooth. He held only one parish position as parish priest of Bantry, 1951-52, before becoming bishop, and he quickly established himself as a national commentator on social and political issues. And here is one example from the Southern Star. Land ownership, bishops warning against socialist teaching statement in Dahl. This is one of the many things you can read in the Star about Lucy's statements on current political issues of the time. Um, it seems that Bishop Lucy and Henshi in Dromore were quite close personally. Um, as I mentioned, Henshi was a, was a frequent contributor to the, the Diocesan magazine. Lucy appointed him a canon of the diocese in 1963. That's always kind of a good sign of being close to the bishop. And he was also, I said, given this unusual opportunity to write about his life for the Fold magazine uh, in later years. Henshi was rewarded, I think, for that friendship by being made parish priest of Cora in 1953 um, at the age of 65. And so the thing here to remember is that the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, a huge glut of priests in Ireland. Uh, and that meant that you often had to kind of lang stay as a curate until your 60s. The average age of becoming par a parish priest was uh, er early 60s. Um, so you had to wait until someone above you, not really retired, but in many cases died, before you were given that job. So Henshi only finally kind of becomes his own man and parish priest at the age of 65. Compare that with Lucy, who's kind of on a kind of intellectual fast track, you know, where because he's teaching ethics, because he's an intellectual in, in Maynooth, he very briefly does the parish priest thing, and then he's bishop. And he stays bishop for all, about 30-something years. So he's, he's bishop at a young age. Similar story for Bishop Michael Brown of Galway, um, who is bishop at the age of, he's under 40, and he's in power for almost 40 years. So it's like there's two different tracks, like the civil service, slow track, fast track. Um, if you're a normal priest, you have to linger around for ages before you become parish priest. If you're kind of at the intellectual end of the church, you have a good chance of becoming a bishop when you're young and then staying there for ages. Um, but for Henshi, the move to Cora in 1953 had a great effect on him, and he wrote about it. He was set free from the city after 18 years, and he commented that, quote, he went from using an electric razor to managing with a basin of cold water a cutthroat and the light of a candle in Cora. The little parish church, that's the one at Kalinic, um, now mostly demolished, um, it had no pulpit, he said, and the people were all around. It was like teaching in a classroom of very attentive pupils. Slightly kind of patronising view of local religious people, but fair enough. Um, Henshi was greatly affected by the humble piety of the rural people as he saw it, and he was taken um, by the large cross that they had erected on top of Dromore Hill during the holy year of 1950. Um, many of you will know it on the main road from Cork to Bantry. In 1950, 45 local men and many horses had been involved in um, the building of it. And I would, uh, if anyone's interested in this, um, Fanula Finley has written a lovely blog entry about the murdering Glen nearby, um, and you can read more about Dromore Hill and its history. Um, for Henshi, the building of the cross was a great kind of sign of Catholic triumphalism. And he wrote about it in the magazine The Fold. In, this is a picture of the murdering Glen. In June 1954, the article is called The Cross on the Hill. And I want to read out just a bit of his article to give you a sense of the language that he's using as well. So Henshi wrote, Henshi wrote, There is something fascinating about hills. I do not mean small, tame, little mounds but the bare rocky heights showing their strength in naked stone. I saw the cross for a moment, looking like a flag floating over a besieged fortress. Sad thoughts engendered by the cold, grey, wintry clouds were dispersed by the realisation that no matter what happened, that flag would ever float victoriously. The stronghold would never be taken. It would always dominate the height and bring strength and joy, even in the darkest hours, to those who lifted their eyes towards it. The language there is, is actually of the Tower House, strangely, to go back to the earlier <laughs> session. It's the fortress on the hill. So the cross is standing in for the 
the Tower House, and it, it will also be defended against attack and so on. So Cromwell's always in the background in <laughs> writing in the 50s. Um, and the article then kind of goes on and takes a turn where he tells the story of a terminally ill man in Dromore from whom basically all hope had been lost of recovery. Um, and I, I'm sure this, this is a real story. I mean, some people may even know who, who the man is. I don't know who he is, and, and hence she doesn't give a name. But he says in the article... Suddenly, like a gleam of sunshine on a wrecked place, peace shone on his face, the ill, the ill man's face. His eyes lost their lacklustre despair. He had looked up to the top of the hill and saw the cross. Then, like a soldier hearing the trumpet call, he straightened his withered frame and squared his thin shoulders. A firm line marked the hitherto trembling lips. Though the tears had not dried on his cheeks, his face had changed from that of a frightened child to the face of a strong man who had regained the hope of winning through. We were at the gate of his house, Henshi says. Father, the man says, I can see the cross from here. It is an empty cross. Christ is no longer hanging dead on the wood. He is living. Sure, Father, please God, we will all be together one day soon. He conquered death, and with God's help, I and mine will too. And then Henshi finished the article with a reflection. Coming down the road, I thanked God for the splendour of the high hills, and the greatness of the soul of the men who were born and who lived amongst them. I prayed to God that I might be worthy to follow in the footsteps of the priests who went before me and planted the message of the cross so finely in the heart of the men of the hills. I think in that you get a strong sense of the rural romanticism of a priest who is set free from the inner city in the early 50s. Um, and he's, he's brought up on um, D.P. Moran, um, on uh, Gaelic Ireland in the, in the 18th century, on a certain type of writing about rural Ireland um, that Roy Foster, I think, also talked about yesterday that was part of the cultural nationalist movement of the late 19th century. And so that gives you some sense of, of the, the rhetoric that surrounds um, the church building. But then to go on and talk more about the church itself, um, Lucy announced a diocesan church building fund in May 53, soon into his time as bishop, and he said that, quote, even in its simplest form, each of the five Cork City rosary churches would cost around 80,000 punts each. He then wanted to raise around half a million punts to do the whole thing. He planned to raise the money by three different methods. Um, subscriptions from businesses and wealthy people in the diocese who would be paid back eventually without interest. Um, donations, he said, from Cork men now living elsewhere in Ireland, in Britain and in America. Again, the hope always that they were very wealthy Cork men in America, however true that was in practice, and also from weekly collections in each parish. All of the subscriptions in the diocese were to be sent to Lucy directly, and then Lucy would give out free loans and grants, or loans or grants to different parishes, repayable through the local parish collection. Um, it's clear from Lucy's comments at the time that the city churches in, in Cork um, the rosary churches would take priority. He said, quote, there's a pressing need to build in, quote, the thickly populated, rapidly growing suburbs. The, 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 sort of, the, the under language there is the fear of what would happen working class areas of Cork without churches if people were left to fend for themselves. And Bishop Michael Brown of Galway uses language um, like savages to, to, when he's worrying about what would happen if he didn't build churches there quickly. Um, but Dromore in rural Cork was actually the first one to be consecrated during Bishop's long time, or during Lucy's long time as Bishop, and it was the first completely new church in Cork since Seamus Murphy's church at Blackpool in 1945. Dromore was to seat 400 people; it's quite small. Most churches were about 800 to 1,000, and cost about 17,000 pounds. It's likely that Bishop Lucy and Canon Henshi jointly conceived and proposed of the, the new church. Because only a month or so after Henshi arrived in Cora, he read out a letter at Mass which he had got from Lucy. More than likely what that meant is that um, he requested a letter from Lucy, he then got the letter and then he read it out. Um, he read it at the Mass and echoing the situation in nearby Drimalig, where a new church was also being planned at this time, Lucy in his letter that Sunday commented, your church at Dromore is in very bad condition, so bad, in fact, that to put it in good order would cost as much to replace it as with... Uh, and even if the church were put in order, it would still not be 
nearly as nice or as sound as a new church. It should be possible to get a really nice church built for £15,000. And he then went on to basically say that you should go and raise the money and build a new church. Um, Henshi was very keen on this and, and then used Lucy's letter as a justification for the church building project. Um, and it was in many ways a double success for Henshi. Not only was he back in rural Cork, but he was also now going to emulate what had happened at Gagan near Bandon in the late 20s and build his own Chapel of Ease. Fundraising in Dromore started almost immediately and before the end of 1953 a network of collectors had been appointed and in January 1954 plans took a great leap forwards with the offer of a site free of charge. Uh, in time the old 1820s church was demolished and was now a car park in Dromore. Henshi described it as, quote, beyond repair, from its sagging roof to its stone flagged floor, there comes a breath of decay. Its crumbling blotched walls and stoke-like hold sacristy are certainly not fit surroundings for the king of kings. And as with most of, most of the court churches of the 50s and 60s, there was an American connection. And um, that was that the site was donated by a brother of Father Donald Cahan, who the Southern Star said ministers in the oil-producing state of Oklahoma. And that was a useful way to get money back so the site came free and that reduced the cost of building. Many events were organised locally to pay for it, um, including performances by the Skibbereen Catholic Young Men's Society players. Um, and there are lots of religious plays that were put on to raise money. So in 1954, Bishop Lucy paid two visits to Dromore in the space of just a fortnight. The first was to bless the site and to lay the foundation stone. Construction proceeded rapidly, um, and here are some photographs of that, that, that are in Dromore Church. And updates were sent to the local press, Southern Star, on at least four occasions over the next year. It was hoped to have the whole thing finished during the Marian year of 1954, the church dedicated to Mary. The church is a pretty simple structure. It's 100 feet by 40 feet, um, simple kind of box church. Uh, but many of you will have noted that it... Um, has a very un interesting feature, which is, um, well, sorry, on the inside, it's very similar to Gagan, just to make that point, that it's, um, it follows very closely what Henshi himself had seen as a young man. Um, but in terms of the exterior, what's obviously very notable is the round tower. And there you can draw many comparisons between the church at Dromore and what's happening, say, earlier at the Honan Chapel at UCC. Um, here are two photographs of that. Uh, or look at other buildings, uh, particularly medieval buildings, such as this in, in Ross Gray in Cash Tipperary, um, looking at Celtic revival designs, essentially. Um, and so for Dromore Church, it was very important for Henshi that the design was medieval as well, that it was, what we term, Hiberno-Romanesque or whatever, um, and that it had a round tower and that it, it was distinctly Irish. It had to look Irish somehow. The architect of Dromore Church was Harry Fitzgerald Smith, Fitzgerald Smith was very, quite interested in modernist architecture and was friends with many of Cork's leading modernists, such as Frank Murphy, who did Drimma League Church. Um, but Fitzgerald Smith's only other church in Cork was the one at Farron Ree, up on the hill in North Cork. And Drumore is, is unlike his other churches in that it goes full out for Hiberno Romanesque detailing, for, for, in, for bringing back older styles of church building uh, in Ireland. And Henshi was, as I mentioned, Henshi was very keen on the architecture and how it would work together with the landscape. And so as the church is being built, he takes to the Fold magazine to write about it. And as I mentioned with um, Fanula's article about the murdering glen, it's this valley just up behind Dromore, um, and there's a legend attached to it that he also refers to. So in his um, talk, or in his article, he said, the murdering glen is a sinister name. The ragged mountain road that crawls like a wounded snake round rocks and boulders, does not take from its air of gloom. There is an overhanging ledge of stone over a cave to the east side of the old bridal pass. Here a murderess and her son lived. Her reddened knife and blunderbuss were the terror of the travellers. Her son was caught and taken to Cork. He was sentenced to be hanged. On the scaffold he told of treasures he had buried at Dromore Hill. They were never found. All that remains now is the cave and the overhanging jutting rock. The hill of Dromore still hides the fabled pot of gold. 
And then he goes on, another mother's dwelling place will soon rise near this ill omen spot. Her son, too, was put to death as a criminal, making a uh, link, um, but not before he gave us his treasure. And in the new church of Mary Immaculate in Dremore will shine and flicker the ruby lamp, showing where the treasure of the beating heart of Jesus waits for all. And so the, the church itself is being placed in the landscape, and it's also not just invoking this uh, history, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, um, of mergers in the merger in, in the glen behind Tremor, but also of underlying trend of Cromwell, of religious persecution in the landscape, and so on. And he wrote and one more piece just uh, from the fold um, that directly talks about Cromwell. He said, The Cromwellian generals regarded priests as a danger in the settlement of Ireland. In 1650, an order was made to arrest them. The captured clergy were sent to France or Spain or Barbados. And then he goes on to say, It is evening. He's standing there looking at the hill. The golden red rays of the setting sun transform the rugged ranges of the hills into shining towers and gleaming battlements. Standing on a summit, I think of the great priests and people who lived in this land, of their great faith when, when, which, when driven underground, gained strength. I thank God that the new church of Mary Immaculate, dominating the Valley of Tremor, mirrors again the living strength and power of the same faith which gathered our forefathers around the mass rocks of the high hills long ago. He also mentions the Round Tower specifically in his commentary on the church and on the landscape. Um, he talks about it as being like a sword. Um, he, he relates it back to Celtic um, art and so on and talks about that the, the church itself would be a new kind of military position in the landscape. Again, the tower house is there in the background and Ireland's very unsettled um, 17th century history is always cropping up. Um, but for the round tower, which in some ways is the most distinctive part of the church and what you see from the main road driving from Cork to Bantry, this is, by the way, is from, taken from a train going past before the railway closed to Bantry. Um, one of the few colour images of, uh, taken of a train line at that time in West Cork, but gives us a lovely picture of it before, in later years, trees block the church which have been recently cut down and so on. But you, you see it here brand new. Um, for the round tower, you can see that um, Henshi was looking around to other... Um, versions of that. So on the left is the O'Connell monument that was done by George Petrie, isn't it, at, at Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. So there's, there's, a, there's obvious kind of precedence for using a round tower for the church. And on the inside of Dromore Church, in the stained glass, you see the Marian influences coming through because of it being 1954 and the Marian year and so on. I want to speak briefly about this man, um, who is kind of, I think, pretty well forgotten today. Um, but this is Joseph Scannell, who was the, um, what was his title in the diocese? But basically, he was number two in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And Scanlon also had been president of St. Finbar's in Farn Ferris, so, and one of the most influential Catholics in Cork. Um, and Scanlon came along to give the speech at the consecration of, of the church when it was finished. Um, and in his speech, he said, Your pastor has written recently and in a very touching manner of the mass rocks of the parish, poor mute witnesses to the fidelity of your ancestors, despite a persecution as cruel as mean and as despicable as any from the first to the twentieth century. You will preserve these squalid relics of a sadly glorious past. They will shed a halo around this church. And then he went on to say, the story of your parish is the story of Ireland, a story of fidelity to religious principle despite material loss, a story of suffering and of ultimate victory. And you who present this church to God today are acting in the best traditions of our motherland. You are no mere group worshipping in a secluded monster shrine. You are active members of the greatest society the world has ever known or ever would know. And he went on to say, ever and always it was morning somewhere, and ever and always mass was being offered somewhere on earth. Today a new voice is added to the chorus of adoration, praise and love. And this, of course, is the rhetoric of the empire of which the sun never sets, um, strangely adopting the terminology of the British Empire, you know, one where mass is always being said, it's always daylight somewhere, it's always day somewhere, um, but gives a sense of the Catholic triumphalism of these years. And just very briefly to, to finish up, 
Tremor is quite unusual in that, in the, the extent of the Catholic triumphalist rhetoric of the time. And we see a lot less of it in the city churches. We also see a lot less effort to go and recreate Hiberno-Romanesque Irish architectural features in the design. So if you look at, say, the city churches in Cork of the 50s, the first to be finished was the one by Boyd Barrett, who was um, a distant relation of the politician Boyd Barrett. Um, <laughs> but this man is, actually should be better known in Cork because he basically designed every council house that was built in the county. Um, this is the church of Grona Broher up in, in, in North Cork, and you can see um, very, very much more kind of contemporary style being used in it. Um, those of you who know Bantry will also recognise these interior arches, um, and Boy Barrett got the contract to rebuild Bantry Church after the roof collapsed in around 1940. Um, that's why we have a similar design to it here. If you look around other parts of Cork City, um, Boy Barrett's church at Ballyfihan, the second one finished, no distinctive attempt to make an Irish style to it, very much coming out of Italian architecture instead. If you look around to Drimaleague, I think it's the most interesting church in the county of these years, and they have written about in the Cork Local History Journal. Um, no connection to Irish traditional architecture. This is by, by uh, Frank Murphy. Um, or look around Cork City and you see Dennehy's Cross. Again, um, where the architecture is coming from at times, I'm not exactly sure, but it's definitely not Ireland. Um, maybe it's coming from Istanbul. Um, or you look up at Mayfield, and you see again not much going on. Or Boyd Barrett's later churches, uh, Tower and Cork City. Or the extension at the back of the Catholic Cathedral also, um, not much happening in terms of Hibernia Romanesque. And interestingly, to finish off, Henshi was a certain type of priest that I think you know, we could look at and study in more detail, in that wherever he went, he built something. It was a bit like the parish priest who he had wrote, wrote kind of favourably about in Bandon. So after he left Cora in 1955, just when the church was finished, he went on to Dunmanway, he did some repair works there, then he went on to Crosshaven, and he added this tower and extended the church in Crosshaven. Um, and he went around the diocese everywhere he went, basically. He added something else to it. Um, but this is slightly later uh, in the 60s. And by that time, the, the use of the Irish features has kind of completely fallen out of it. And I think we can relate that, um, although there's more work to be done on it, into broader changes that are happening at the time where there is a move away from a distinctly Irish Ireland mentality towards a much more kind of open one. And when I talked about this before, someone said that this was, they said, quote, more like Sputnik than Clonmac Noise. Um, that was a pretty good summary. Um, I, I'll stop there if that's okay. Um, I'm happy to take questions on it. Um, but just to sum up, what I really was trying to do today was to give a glimpse into the language of the 50s, the architecture of the 50s, at a time when supposedly the church was immensely powerful. And in some ways it must have been because it was able to fund this, it was able to build this. But we then have to question, well, how did it fall away so quickly? And you see that not just in architecture, but you see that more broadly, of course, in political and social things as well. So I'll stop there. Well, I, I hate to say it, but I am one of the people who remembers the 50s very well, and I'm sure lots of you out there do. Any questions? Can I just make tiny little um, point. Mm -hmm. My father actually designed uh, right. He worked for Fred Marshall. What was his name? Edward O'Connell. Oh, right. And I, I grew didn't... up with that church. <laughs> and in fact, we drove past it when I was about 14 or 15. And um, I wish I could take it back. I said, I wouldn't tell anybody that. Uh, no, 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 totally disagree. We came back to where I lived six years ago, we're living actually in Bantry, yeah. and I made the trip to Trimley, and I have to tell you, I was just blown away by his, his just genius with light, the yeah. whole simplicity the of it, the interior, absolutely blown away. I wish... I could tell him now. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's a great well. story. But he yeah. worked for Frank Borshaw. Yeah, great, great. Yeah. What a great story. At the back. Um, you mentioned uh, speaking of your kids in Bantry, and, and I can't remember that piece, but you just mentioned it in passing. Yeah. And it's what, um, what, what did you say? Oh, so that, that's in a book by an anthropologist called Chris Epper. Oh, <coughs> and the book is called The Ruling Trinity. And that his trinity is business, the church, and 
I think it's sports it's number three now, but I can't actually remember but he, he's, he spent years in Bantry trying to figure out who kind of who had all the power in the town and who was able to do things and he was particularly yeah okay. yeah and so he's particularly interested in the larger businesses in the town Sounds like a book that you should have a read then. <laughs> Sure. One thing I would say is in the Epper book, that obviously he's writing about the 1970s, so it's really it's the O'Keefe era of G.W. Biggs that he's, I think, but he doesn't mention names very much, and that's normal in anthropology, where you're interested in the kind of how the town works, but not in kind of naming or naming and shaming or whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I just made, just to make an observation, you know, your distinction between the intellectual class bracket in relation to the community and the mm -hmm. perhaps the more ordinary parish clergy. That was quite a feature of the time. I mean there were so many priests. You know, I'm, I grew up in Stephen Town where you had four priests. So you had so many families involved and so many connections. But then you had an added factor there in that you had the the old diocese of Ross. Yeah. Which was in the lead in Bantry would have been in the Cork Diocese, whereas Ross was the coastal area, mm -hmm. and so like the Bishop of Moynihan was sent there to carry in the early um, 1960s, I think. So it's easy to overlook that now in terms of, to a certain extent, the, 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 I suppose, the, 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 an element of class consciousness and class downright snobbery involved. Mm -hmm. Still have the you mentioned him and Eve in the round tower. Yeah. And of course it's quite a visible attraction because of the you know, the Hindu gathering and all of that. But those of you who know Ross Carver, you see the Celtic Ross Hotel. Mm. And they recapture that idea of the you know, the the round tower as well. Yeah, on a bigger scale. Yeah. Oh yeah, and it's quite a, a characteristic feature now of, of the yeah. town. Yeah. I mean the the comment I make on Dramore is that Yes, it's a m medieval style round tower. It's done in concrete. Yeah. Um, and that's, I suppose, the big change of the time machine. If you th think about the one in Timaleague, it's faced in stone. Um, and it's of an earlier construction period, like 1910 ish, I think, isn't it? But Dromore is, for cost reasons, the whole church is just breeze blocks and, and concrete blocks. Yeah. There was over here. Triumphalism now. It is, it follows the fact I'm very dramatic. Could be all do at times, but 
I also remember being a child in Cork City when the police he was building the first bit. I don't know if he omitted or didn't know that he organised, he would have been against the police for the police. Mm -hmm. And uh, the paper collection, which was written for greatly the cost of the first bit, this was organised in the school and there were prizes at the council saying for the best class in the best school. So people collected there. They were actually collecting litter for the first bit and money was made of it. And the, the name of the whole I thought there were too much jewellery to be visible to the tabernacle. So I mean, some of my ancestors have gave to me tabernacle. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's important to be even-handed about comments. And I, think I don't know what snide comments I made actually, and I don't think that I have a parade that's being rained on. No, well, I, I, that's, that's only... Uh, I accept your point about today we see the opposite, which is a type of hyper agnosticism or yeah, yeah well absolutely but I'm I'm not actually trying to dismiss this period. I'm actually trying to understand it more broadly and I'm not making snide comments about it. Well each time you refer to somebody of the clergy, they were referred to by their surname. As opposed to what sorry? By the first name? Well other people like architectural people were referred to referred by their full name. I mean, you are uh, actually, that's not correct. I refer to full names at first case and then surnames afterwards consistently for secular and for sacred people. And I did that deliberately to not cause offence to anyone. And that's what I think most historians do. So I, I really don't take that point. I'm sorry. Well, I have great respect for these people. Mm. And you also made speeches on the economic status and the running of businesses in the city. I was constantly inside in that era, but I do remember adults who spoke to me that he had written them talking to them. Sure, as I, as I said, the Southern Star is filled with his comments, many of which are very interesting. He's deeply, Lucy is deeply interested in depopulation. He's deeply worried that what that will mean if immigration continues. I think he was um, a great intellectual. I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I refute the allegation of snide comments. All I'm trying to do is get past the Brian Fallon comment about that these priests were Philistines. I would never say the priests were Philistines. There were also topics of a situation where education wasn't accurate in the small g sense. A lot of them were the child of a farm that was sent home to educate themselves or wasn't the farm sufficient. So they wouldn't have a global or a capital no, I, think I, think we we, I think we agree yeah. on that. Yeah. I think your point's well made. There was another question, uh, and then yeah. I have to go. Okay. Uh, uh, five people reported. One, I'm mm -hmm. wondering where, um, or rather, in what, what edition of Southern Star will you find the bit about the dangers of drinking cold coffee? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> the references, the best, the fastest way to get it is there was a, a, a book published by Michael Sheehy in the mid 1960s. I think the book, um, I can't remember the name of it now. He not very well known writer, and the book is very hostile to the church. It's a very unfair book to the church if you read it. And he has a full chapter which is a scathing attack on Lucy's sermons, which he gives the footnotes in the Southern Star to all of the sermons, including the ones on Trinity College Dublin. So I would use that for the references, but it's extremely hostile and unfriendly and unfair to Lucy. Oh, yeah, I was just curious to look up the uh, the original. Yeah. And so the second one, I was wondering to what extent was it, uh, say, deliberate policy or just a matter of happenstance? It's a big picture, and you'd have to look at it. Say, in the city churches where they're planning new housing estates, sometimes they left sites that would be attractive, that would be then used for churches. In other cases, the diocese has to fight with councils to get sites. There's huge problems getting sites. The, the church is ripped off by many private landlords who refuse to sell good sites unless they're given plenty of money. Um, it, it's a much richer, broader story. and There's no kind of simple, straight answer for how sites turn up. This is really, the, it, yes, it's a dominating site, but actually it's, it's, it's built there because the site's given free. All right, I think I'll bring it to a close. Um, thank you, Richard, and uh, reminding me what I said, that this is the kind of history that encourages us to think about stuff we really haven't thought about before. So let's hear it for Richard. <laughs>